Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining this program, Island Archaeology and the Anthropocene. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the Community Relations Team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore a theme in our programming, and this month's theme is islands. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Scott Fitzpatrick. He is both a museum a professor in the Department of Anthropology and Associate Director of the Museum of Natural and Cultural History at the University of Oregon. He is an archaeologist who specializes in the prehistory and historical ecology of island and coastal regions, particularly the Pacific and Caribbean. Much of his research is focused on prehistoric colonization events, seafaring strategies, adaptation to smaller islands, exchange systems, and the human impacts on ancient environments. Thank you so much, Dr. Fitzpatrick, for taking the time to talk about ancient human impacts and future sustainability. Yeah, thanks, Laurel, for the nice introduction, and thanks for having me. Um, so I'll share my screen here. Um, so as Laurel said, um, I am an archaeologist, and I work um, on islands, um, predominantly small ones around mostly the Southern Caribbean and the Western Pacific, although I have um, ongoing projects in a number of other places, including the Florida Keys and the Oregon Coast and uh, other places here and there. Um, but the majority of what I've done over the course of my career thus far has predominantly dealt with how humans have gotten to islands and what happened to humans once they got there, not only to the, their societies, but also to island environments. And so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is, um, has kind of revolved around, it revolves around issues uh, about how we can look at islands as potential corollaries for lots of different things, not only what's happening to um, Earth's biosystems, but also what that means for life on Earth today and where we go beyond that. So I'm going to be talking about a number of different concepts, and my presentation outline um, basically will kind of follow this, um, this right here. Um, so I'm going to go over what is the Anthropocene, and some of you might, and a lot of you might be familiar with this term, but just in case not, I'll give you some background on that. Um, and then I'll talk about how we conceive of islands archaeologically as what we call model systems. Uh, I'll go over some archaeological evidence on islands that I'll use to convey and uh, try and put into context some of these issues that we're talking about. Uh, in terms of humans getting there and what happens after they get there. Uh, and we'll be looking at some human impacts and also issues of resilience. Um, I'll also link the past to the future. And so what do islands offer us as analogs to um, kind of expand in, in some ways very philosophically about what we're doing today um, on our own planet and what that means for the future of, of interplanetary um, colonization, um, looking essentially as, uh, at Earth as an Earth island. So let's um, talk about the Anthropocene first. So this is a term that was coined by Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist, Paul Crutzen. And he had the idea that humans are a driver of our planet's climate and ecosystems. That essentially you can't decouple what humans, um, uh, human impact or the human uh, footprint that we have, that anything that goes on on Earth today is essentially connected to humans. Um, Crutzen proposed that the Anthropocene began with increased atmospheric carbon levels caused by the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th century, and this included the invention of the steam engine in AD 1784, um, the use of coal as a fossil fuel, um, and so he kind of threw this out there in a, in a paper and uh, immediately began a discussion among a wide variety of different natural and social scientists about what the Anthropocene really was. And archaeologists in particular were interested because we have the experience of um, working uh, on materials that were left by humans in the ancient past. And we see a lot of impacts that humans have had prior to this period of the Industrial Revolution. So our question was, does this Anthropocene have more ancient roots. Um, in response to this, the Strat Stratigraphy Commission of the Geological Society of London created a new working group and they pulled in a lot of different scientists, mostly geoscientists, to explore whether this concept had merit. They later brought in um, social scientists when they realized, I think, that there was a greater discussion to be had in regards to this concept. So what is the Anthropocene? 
Um, well, there's numerous alternative starting dates now, and there's different kind of primary markers for this. And there's a criteria problem here for what we call the hard rock criteria problem. So geological periods of time are defined by hard rock that's left in the earth in these different stratigraphic layers. Uh, what the Anthropocene was proposing though, is that um, humans have really left this indelible mark over millennia on the earth's landscape. And this ranges from uh, the development of agriculture and land clearance, uh, the urbanization of human societies, the expansion to nearly every part of the globe, um, except for Antarctica, um, wars, conflicts, all of these kinds of things that have left a footprint of what humans have done to the earth. And so we now have really no consensus about what the Anthropocene is yet, but we do have these different starting dates that go back to you know almost 14,000 years ago when we start seeing things like uh, spikes in pollen of different kinds of plants. And that's a result of um, what, what, what really is the beginning of uh, the Holocene, if you're familiar with that term, but also um, the agricultural revolution where humans for the first time are beginning to domesticate plants. They're uh, becoming farmers and this really accelerates between about 8,000 and 5,000 years ago. And we can see examples of this happening in ice cores where humans are burning landscapes. They're changing essentially the, um, the earth's biosphere and hydrosphere in many different ways. They're, you know, um, uh, creating irrigation networks, canals, uh, again, sort of the expansion of cities and all of these things. And certainly we see artifacts that are showing up in many different parts of the world around 2000 to 1000 BP. Humans are essentially almost everywhere. Uh, and certainly we start to see um, during the industrial revolution, uh, increased levels of CO2 and CH4, and then uh, the atomic age in AD 1945. So some of the considerations here that we look for um, and that we kind of discuss is that the Anthropocene boundary is determined by one of two things. One is a numerical age. This is a global standard stratigraphic age or a physical stratigraphic section or ice core. Um, this is often called the golden spike. And these are generally the domain of geoscientists. In this sense, the composition of the working group is not surprising because the Anthropocene would be defined on the basis of human domination of Earth's systems. However, we really feel like the debate must include perspectives from um, scientists like archaeologists, historians, and other social scientists. So when did the Anthropocene really begin? So there's a big question. Whoops, let me go back here. So um, Stefan uh, and a number of colleagues um, published a paper in 2007, not long after this concept had been established. And they said pre-industrial societies could and did modify coastal and terrestrial ecosystems, but they did not have the numbers, social and economic organization or technologies needed to equal or dominate the great forces of nature in magnitude or rate. Their impacts remained largely local and transitory, well within the bounds of the natural variability of the environment. And so this immediately struck a nerve with archeologists because this basically said, well, before um, human societies had become industrialized within the last couple of centuries, we really can't see any impact that humans may have had. And we can't, if we, if we see it, we really can't distinguish it between what's happening naturally. So what about archaeology and how do islands play a role in this conversation? Okay, so first I want to start here just looking at island colonization on a global scale. So this is a really big period of time. This graph right here, this chart represents a million to 500 years ago. And if you look at the bottom, uh, sorry, the far left, this is distance in kilometers and it starts as from zero at the bottom and 200 at the top. And then the timeline goes from on the left 1 million years ago to 500 years ago. And what this is meant to show is that humans um, first established um, watercraft probably um, almost a million years ago because we have evidence of humans getting to the island of Flores about that time. Um, that's pretty extraordinary. Um, these are hominins that we think were Homo erectus. Um, they're found in other parts of Indonesia. But the interesting thing about Flores is that it was never connected to another landmass. So people's needed to get, um, get there using some kind of water Craft, even if it was a simple raft. And then um, beginning uh, much later in time, we see a real explosion of maritime activity. So peoples are going further 
and they're going faster. And we start to see places like the Bismarck Archipelago around New Guinea, uh, the Ryukyus, uh, southern Japan, uh, Australia, uh, some islands like Crete and Milos in the Mediterranean. And so here we have lots of different places around the world where people are developing watercraft and they're getting out to islands and they're going further and further. So this represents a period of about 900,000 years. So a big gap here and then kind of this really big explosion. And then if we kind of condense this down a little bit, we've got 15,000 to 100 years ago. And here again, distance on the left, but you'll notice instead of going to 200 kilometers, this goes to 7,000 kilometers. And these are straight line distances. And anybody who's been on a boat knows that you really can't ever go in a straight line distance across an ocean. But suffice to say, we'll just use that as kind of a general um, distance measure. Um, so we have the Channel Islands of California that are settled pretty early, and but they're very close to the mainland. And then as we move to in time, to the right um, around the last 5,000 years, again, we start to see islands in the Caribbean settled for the first time, um, islands in Micronesia and the rest of the Pacific. And then we see Columbus at the top who traveled very far. Um, and we start to see um, sort of what we call the age of exploration or the age of enlightenment, uh, where peoples are moving across um, Europeans or moving across uh, the Atlantic and moving into the Pacific and Indian Ocean and so on and so forth. Okay, so what these charts are just meant to represent is we have um, a real push for peoples wanting to explore maritime environments and they're getting out to islands and they're doing it um, uh, through time farther and farther away. Okay, so the question here is peoples are getting to islands, they're starting to get to some really remote ones. In fact, Hawaii and Easter Island and New Zealand are among the most remote island groups in the world. Um, what happens when people first get to islands? And that's something that I'm really interested in as an archeologist. Well, we have to decouple natural and anthropogenic changes. So natural changes are shifts in environmental conditions that are not caused by humans, but do impact those environments. So these would be things like um, uh, cyclical climatic shifts, um, ENSO, which stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation Events that occur every three to seven years in the Pacific, um, storms and droughts and things like that. Now, anthropogenic ones are shifts that are caused by humans, and these can impact both humans and their surrounding environment. And these might include things like deforestation, the introduction of new plants and animals, and overhunting both um, wild and introduced animals. So when we look at the colonization of islands, um, my colleagues and I refer to these, and I think this is becoming more of an accepted concept, is we refer to islands as model systems. And this isn't an idea that we uh, invented. This is uh, the idea of model systems kind of developed out of ecology. Um, but um, I wrote a paper with uh, John Erlinson, who's the executive director at the Museum of Natural and Cultural History here, who's one of the world's authorities on coastal archeology. span And he and I said, because of the relative remoteness, isolation, and boundedness, islands can serve as model systems for examining not only the impacts humans may have had on novel landscapes, but also the degrees to which they enhance or managed different resources. Okay, so some of the examples of the natural and anthropogenic changes we might see include past sea level and identifying what those were. Um, these are related to paleoclimate or glacial periods. So interglacial periods are warmer and glacial periods are colder. In glacial periods, we see um, ice being um, kind of sucked, water being sucked up in the polar ice caps and sea levels drop. And then during interglacial periods, those polar ice caps melt and then sea level rises. Um, we can see these, um, for example, in paleo shoreline notches. So in the top right um, photo, you see a little island uh, in a place where I've been working for more than 20 years called Palau in Western Micronesia. And we can see that um, at low tide, uh, these kind of look like mushrooms almost. Um, and these are these kind of underlying um, uh, notches underneath are representative of what, sh of what um, shorelines were or what sea level was uh, at different points in time. We can also look at things like coastal sediments. If we see um, an influx of uh, sand and shells and things like that in inland areas that might be indicative of a different shoreline change. Uh, and then we also try and establish a relationship with island subsidence and uplift. And so even sea level changes might be um, mediated by um, gradual uplift or subsidence of different kinds of landforms. And we certainly get that in different parts of the world. <clears throat> 
We also see different kinds of vegetation changes and these happen naturally, but they can also happen culturally too. So we look at different things like sediment types, uh, pollen types and the concentration of those pollen. Um, charcoal concentrations are indicative of burning. Um, that is sometimes difficult to discern between natural and anthropogenic sources. Um, but these are often most, um, these are most often used for um, looking at when people may have gotten to islands. And this chart on the right is what we call a pollen diagram. And what this shows is that in this particular case, um, this is an island in, uh, in uh, Polynesia called Mangaya. And what we see here is a change from a forested environment to one that becomes very um, savanna-like. And in conjunction with increased levels of charcoal particles in those sediments, which seems to be indicative of burning, this has been um, used as an argument that peoples got to the island, they started uh, clearing forests by burning, which is a very common um, strategy, and that environment was now, that landscape was now indelibly changed as a result. We can also look at more discrete events like uh, El Nino uh, and droughts that that might cause. So in um, El Nino events, we see changes in wind patterns in the Pacific and uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, changes in rainfall patterns, and these can be identified through multiple methods. And, and in the colonization of the Pacific in particular, um, there's lots of different push and pull factors and why people might wanna go out and settle different kinds of islands and why they might abandon those. Um, on the far right here, you see a series of graphs and these are for different islands. And the top one is Vanuatu, then it goes Samoa, Society Islands, um, and so on. And what you see here are um, changes in climate. And what we are trying to do archeologically is figure out, okay, if we have um, extended periods of drought, for example, we know that this would stress societies. They would not be able to produce enough food. And this might be the impetus um, for depopulation or maybe even for uh, migration out to a different place. And we see in this band right here, starting about AD 900 to 1300, um, if you look at this, we start to see things like um, increased levels of conflict, um, people are are um, uh, building more monumental architecture, defensive fortifications, and these seem to coincide with periods of drought that may be resulted um, a result of El Nino events. So um, we are kind of trying to combine lots of different lines of evidence from climate um, studies, from archaeology and so on to paint a picture of what we think is happening to this, these societies and how they're responding as a result. So. Um, when we're um, doing archeological research and we're trying to uh, identify initial arrival and settlement on islands, this, this can be kind of tricky. Um, we have a really good need for good chronologies. And there is, you know, we use radiocarbon dating um, as our kind of primary source of this, but there's a standard error in there. And it's, um, uh, it's sometimes kind of tricky to see within even a century or two, whether people got on a landscape, but through more refined techniques and um, statistical modeling, we're able to narrow those um, ranges down pretty good. Um, we also look for impacts of settlement. So what do we expect to see when humans get to a new environment? And keep in mind that these islands have um, developed for you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of years without humans. And then humans get there and they're bringing with them, you know, they're colonizing groups. So they're bringing with them the things they need to survive. They're bringing plants and animals. Um, they're uh, in, you know, accidentally bringing other kinds of things like insects, um, rats. And these have, a, you know, a, these have the potential and, and we see this archaeologically of causing great havoc on island systems where you get lots of unique or endemic species. Um, so we start to see you know, sometimes the overexploitation of endemic resources, the introduction of new species, and then land clearance for uh, growing crops and building villages and so on. Um, we see the overexploitation of wild foods in some cases too, and this is what we call resource switching. So peoples will start exploiting a food resource and they exhaust that or it gets to the point where it just becomes um, too calorically intensive to, um, to harvest and they move to something else. Um, we can see this in the archaeological record. And this gives you an example from um, uh, studies published in Polynesia, where in this case, peoples were harvesting a lot of nerites, these small little shells here, these gastropods. And in these um, stratigraphic zones, and you see in this chart, um, there's a lot of them um, early on, and then they kind of 
decline over time. And what we often see is one resource declines and another one increases uh, as a result of this resource switching. We can also see changes in the size of these organisms. And we often do studies on you know, measuring shells, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, or maybe fish. And we see that people's, um, if they're harvesting uh, really intensively a particular kind of resource, um, they're usually going for the larger, more mature individuals. And as those are over harvested, they have to exploit the same resource, but they're, they're smaller and smaller because they don't have time to um, grow to full maturity. Uh, so we see these kinds of demographic changes in animal species in the archaeological record that are sometimes indicative of, of over exploitation. In some rare cases, um, um, and maybe some, in the case of the Pacific, not so rare cases in terms of birds, um, we see extinctions or sometimes extirpation where uh, uh, you know, the same species might inhabit an archipelago and then it's driven to extinction or extirpation on one island but still persists on another. And there are many, many different endemic species um, that are vulnerable to extinction because they have no fight or flight mechanism to humans uh, and they're very sensitive to the introduction of other animals and things that might outcompete them for food. Um, so we see uh, different growth rates and characteristics that are preferable for hunting um, in, in um, these strategies uh, and sometimes local environmental buffers that uh, restrict humans from exploiting the foods that they want to. So birds across the Pacific, especially the large flightless ones, are known to um, be particularly sensitive to land clearance and also direct predation by humans. And so we see lots of bird extinctions in the Pacific. Now, if we want to look at colonization of the Pacific by humans, there's lots of sort of, you know, hatched polygons in here and arrows and things. But what I want to point out is that we have, if you look at Australia and kind of north of there, we start to see populations moving into these areas between about 35,000 to 50,000 years ago. And then if you look at this yellow blob in the middle, um, this represents um, uh, polony, uh, sort of what we call lapida, but people's moving out into what, what is sometimes termed remote Oceania for the first time. They're leaving their homes and they're getting out into the middle of the ocean and they have no point of reference. They cannot see land. There's no intervisible land. And they do this and they get to Tonga and Samoa um, by about 3,000 years ago. And there's kind of a gap of a couple thousand years before Hawaii and Easter Island and New Zealand is settled. And so the point here is that if you look at this orange, this big orange, uh, what we call pol the Polynesian Triangle, where we see Hawaii at the very top and then Easter Island in the far east and New Zealand in the south, this is a huge expanse of ocean that's colonized within about a 200 to 300 year period. So very quickly. And this um, really... Um, is one of the hallmarks for why we start to see um, island impacts to a much larger degree than we did um, in other places because these people are long distance voyagers. They're bringing with them dozens of people on these larger double hulled canoes. They're bringing provisions with them, lots of plants and animals, and um, they are moving very quickly to these very remote places that have not had humans before. And so they're really ripe for um, having human impacts. We sometimes refer to the movement of all of these uh, sort of this cultural idea of how you survive on an island um, as transported landscape. So people have an idea of how they want to modify a landscape. They bring the plants and the animals, maybe the insects and other things that they need to survive and the knowledge of how to use and modify these resources. And so these transported landscapes um, are essentially um, uh, you know, this collective movement of humans and what they need to survive as part of these colonizing ventures. Not unlike what we um, think of today when uh, we talk about colonizing Mars. What are the kinds of things that we would need to survive uh, that venture and when we got there? Faunal introductions are a big um, issue in terms of uh, uh, island environment impacts. So these are both intentional and unintentional. And we sometimes use what's called a commensal approach. We use the introduction of these animals as a proxy for, um, uh, for human movement. So we'll sometimes see chicken bones or rat bones or pig bones, or sometimes dog and archeological records in the Pacific. And we can use these as kind of a, 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 and a you know, it's a, uh, this idea that people's brought them with them. It's a commensal animal and they're attached to human movement. 
Um, these are known to easily outcompete and prey on endemic sources. And rats in particular are omnivorous. They um, breed very quickly. Um, humans may have brought them purposefully or accidentally. We're not exactly sure. Um, and some of these are gone after settlement. So we see sometimes people bringing pigs to islands and then they go extinct or they extirpate. Um, and this is largely a result of probably people just not being able to, to feed them. And, and pigs can be very destructive too to crops and other things. And so we see humans essentially trying to manage how they bring different animals into different islands. We also see agricultural development um, and people growing crops on, on different islands is critical to their long-term survival. Uh, but in conjunction with that, we see deforestation, erosion. Uh, and so a lot of these islands and, and even the places we live today are essentially culturally managed landscapes. But this did enable human movement, uh, food production in pretty marginal environments like atolls. And we see some pretty unique human um, uh, uh, strategies for surviving in environments that are pretty, you know, marginal. So this bottom left picture that you see here um, is on Easter Island. And these are rock mulch gardens. So people were growing um, things like sweet potato, but using rock as a mulch. Um, we also see an increase um, as peoples move into the, uh, these islands of protecting their resources. Um, and even in some pretty remote small islands, we see defensive fortifications being built. Uh, on the top right, this is from uh, an island called Rapa and in, in central Polynesia. And they're building forts on these hilltops and, and with commanding views of their agricultural fields and in order to protect themselves. Um, in terms of impacts to avifauna or birds, um, I just wanted to show um, one example, and, and there's an archaeologist, uh, sort of an ornithologist slash archaeologist named David Stedman at the Florida Museum of Natural History, and he's been kind of the uh, leader in um, exploring these issues. Um, and I just want to show you one here that's highlighted uh, in New Zealand. And so New Zealand um, has the, the number of archaeological land bird species that New Zealand had before human arrival is 93. And then the number that went extinct or extirpated was 32. Um, and this is not unusual. Um, those birds that are ground dwelling um, are easy to prey upon. Again, they, they don't have a, a flight um, a mechanism when humans get there because they've never seen them before. And we start to see um, a huge decrease in um, the amount of um, species, a number of species that are found on these islands as a result of human intervention. Uh, a classic case of this is the New Zealand moa. So these were um, a number of uh, large um, flight birds called ratites. Um, that were on uh, New Zealand when humans arrived. And uh, on the bottom uh, graph or sort of figure here, you see a moa on the bottom left or on the far left and then humans on the far right. Um, not all moas were this big. There was about six or seven species, I think, that have been identified uh, um, genetically. Um, but the biggest one is about three times the size of an ostrich, just to give you an idea about it. And so humans get there um, around uh, AD 1100. And we have to remember that peoples who are colonizing New Zealand um, are coming from a very tropical environment and they're moving to a temperate environment. And so they're not able to grow the same kinds of foods they, uh, they were before. Uh, they weren't able to exploit the same kinds of resources. And so they come into contact with these huge flightless birds that have no fear of humans and they're easy prey. And so what happens over time is these large flightless birds um, become the primary source of food for the first New Zealanders. And there's a decrease in agricultural productivity. But the moa are extinct within about 150 years. It doesn't take very long. Um, in addition to that, um, the Haas eagle, which is the world's largest eagle, um, it also is driven to extinction as a result of humans over preying on moa because moa were their primary food source. And you see um, the claws of this Haas eagle on the far right um, in comparison to the human hands. So these are huge birds um, that were um, also sensitive to ecological destruction by humans. Um, these moa extinctions are a clear case of human driven extinction. And these are really just small founding groups of people in a short period of time. And we see this happening at a number of different sites in New Zealand. Um, we see uh, humans getting there. Uh, they um, continually and um, uh, expansively 
harvest moa uh, and then those decline as they become extinct uh, there's no more left and they have to resource switch and we see them uh, new zealand uh, maori moving to other sources of food Across Polynesia, we see lots of different pathways that peoples take. It's not um, uh, one case, you know, fits all. Uh, peoples in Hawaii built these really extensive and elaborate fish ponds offshore to trap fish um, at high tide and sort of created almost like a, a natural refrigerator for food storage just to keep fish fresh. Um, lots of agricultural terracing. Um, and other types of strategies. So peoples, uh, it's clear, were uh, developing some pretty novel ways of adapting to their island environments um, and also trying to find ways to maximize um, population growth, but to um, in some ways manage how that was done sustainably. I do a lot of my work in Palau and we're interested in this question too. Um, I work at a site that's uh, called El Ora Orak. This is just off the um, southeast um, corner of the larger island of Babeldob. And Palau is in Western Micronesia, kind of south of Guam and not far from the Philippines, to give you some reference. And we found um, at this site um, thousands and thousands of um, this particular gastropod uh, called the humped conch or Gibberulus gibberulus. And what we see here is um, thousands and thousands, thousands and thousands of these building up over time. And I was interested in trying to figure out whether they were being over harvested. And um, this was kind of interesting because we, um, and when I say we, I mean mostly my undergraduate students at the time, measured thousands of these. And um, we got a good um, sample. And um, what we expected to see was that these shells became smaller over time, but actually they became bigger over time. And this was kind of a curious question for us. But when we look at where the site is located, um, kind of right over here, um, where you see uh, that label Irai Bay, um, there's a big lagoon here. And what we see through time is that peoples are moving to coastal areas and they're growing taro in, in wetland fields. And when people grow taro, there's more erosion, sedimentation that infills these bays. Um, it's nutrient loading for a lot of species. And so what we surmised was even though peoples were exploiting increasingly the species over time, they actually became bigger because um, agricultural activities on the mainland were creating a preference environment for this shell to grow. So kind of a mix of things going on here that um, uh, are contrary to what we originally expected. If we move to the Caribbean, for those of you who are familiar with the region, um, kind of separated into major island groups, Greater Antilles, Lesser Antilles, and the Bahamas. And I've worked, worked a lot of my career in the Southern Caribbean and Barbados and the Grenadines and Curacao. And what we see See here, um, uh, peoples get to the Caribbean beginning about 5,000 or 6,000 years ago. Um, but during um, this major influx of people that come in about 2,500 years ago that we call the ceramic age because they're bringing in pottery and, and they're um, growing crops. And we see an early phase here where peoples are focusing on local resources like land crabs. And these crabs decline in number and then they switch to mollusks. And for archeologists back in the 1930s, this, um, this was so well distinguished in the stratigraphic record or the archaeological record where they got tons of sh um, uh, crab shell on the bottom and then lots of mollusk shells on the top that they called these people the crab um, people and then the shell people. Um, but this was just a case of resource switching. So clearly peoples are over harvesting some species and then having to switch to others. And then later on, beginning about 2000 years ago, um, we start to see the over exploitation of terrestrial fauna and increased reliance on marine foods, particularly mollusks and fish. And then during the later phase in the, in the about thousand years before European contact, we start to see a growing trend of people moving animals, of mammal translocations. Um, these are animals that are brought in from South America. And then there seems to be increased dependence on smaller fishes such as herrings. And, and, uh, and, and we also see some sustainable practices observed too, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. So again, through the history of the Caribbean, although each island is kind of different, these are the general patterns that we begin to see. 
Um, some of these translocations and extinctions we see um, in the Caribbean, you know, these are mostly small rodents, um, the agouti, the opossum, the guinea pig. We also see the peccary, which is in the bottom center there, kind of a cousin to the pig, uh, the armadillo. And then on the top right, we have sloths. And there were giant sloths that were living in places like Cuba and Hispaniola at human arrival. And then they go extinct shortly thereafter. And it seems to maybe be a correlation, although uh, the jury, I think, is still out on that one. Um, I worked on Nevis in the Northern Caribbean too. And I just wanted to show this quickly because um, we got um, tens of thousands of these little nerites too. And I like to show this picture because um, a lot of my students in the back, I had a crew of about 32 students. This is just a small portion of those. And um, I made them uh, clean and wash every little shell. But I had a, an idea in mind and that I also wanted to try and answer this question. Um, and when we look at the harvesting of these nerite shells, these small little gastropods, we don't see any decreases in size. We don't see a decline in the abundance of these. We don't see a decline in the diversity of um, shells that people are eating through time. And so what we suggest is that this is actually a sustainable practice over a period of at least 600 years on this island. However, when people first get to islands, we know they're causing some impacts, but this is nothing compared to what we see after um, the arrival of uh, Euro-Americans and then other peoples too, other colonizing um, groups from Asia or Europe. Um, we start to see in the Caribbean deaths of hundreds of thousands of Amerindians. There's widespread clan clearance, um, we start to see um, uh, commercial crops, coffee, sugarcane, tobacco, um, the decline of lots of different species, um, extinctions of uh, the region's only pinniped, the Caribbean monk seal, uh, manatee exploitation, sea turtles. And so we start to see a rapid decline in biodiversity in the Caribbean as a result of uh, Euro-Americans, uh, uh, different um, Euro European groups, um, particularly the Spanish, the Dutch, the French, um, coming in and uh, re really wreaking havoc on uh, Caribbean um, ecosystems. When we look at a comparison between uh, where I work in Palau and, and the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean, um, we see lots of different cultural feedback loops, as we call them, though, um, which lead us to, to believe that there were some um, some sustainable practices that people recognize that, well, if um, we're clearing land and that sedimentation is running down the rivers and we can see those getting cloudy, and then, you know, a year later, the coral reefs are unhealthy and we can't fish as much, that people are making these connections. And they're recognizing that they need to change some of their cultural behaviors or some of their agricultural practices in response to other things that are happening. And so we see in both of these places for indigenous peoples that yes, they're causing some impacts. Um, we definitely see some pretty good cases of this with like birds in Polynesia, but overall people seem to be kind of managing things a little bit easier and a little bit better than we once thought. So what are some of the current issues today? Um, we see um, on islands, just apart from the archeology span now, um, things like development, tourism, overpopulation, pollution and climate change. So tourism and development is a huge impact to island uh, ecosystems. Uh, we're even seeing the expansion of uh, you know, tourist development into coral reef systems. And some places are doing this fairly well. Um, other places, um, uh, governments do not have the same kinds of uh, you know, environmental impact laws um, or other policies that prevent over, you know, overuse of water and pollution and things like that. So some places are definitely doing it better than other, but on a global scale, tourism and development in um, island uh, coastal systems in particular um, has um, been pretty detrimental. Um, here we have the Marshall Islands in the in the uh, eastern part of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands are kind of like the uh, cover page for climate change and um, increasing sea level rise. So this is a nation of atolls, and we see just how precarious from the air uh, these um, uh, these um, uh, residences are, these small little villages, uh, and how um, uh, you know susceptible they are to um, sea level rise. And if you've ever landed or been you know, on an atoll, um, you can see that, you know, most of these are only about 10 or 12 feet above sea level. Uh, and, uh, and, and they are um, in a very precarious position. 
Um, we even see um, overpopulation in places like Malé in the Maldives. And this, this is also a nation of atolls, but you can see how densely populated um, this region is. And uh, this isn't every island in the Maldives. This is just kind of the capital and the center. Uh, but the Maldivian government is now in negotiation with the Indian government and other places to essentially relocate their population when the time comes where they can not just live, they just can't live there anymore as a result of climate change, in particular um, sea level rise issues. In Kiribati, um, in uh, the Central Pacific, also part of Micronesia, um, we also see kind of overpopulation and dense population in some of these islands. And uh, also, you know, Tarawa here is, is known, uh, well known for some battles in World War II. And uh, this is also, you know, kind of left its indelible mark of human activity on these small islands. And so there's a, a you know, strategically, they've been very important on a historical basis. And we see, you know, remnants of that left. That's also kind of part of this Anthropocene picture that um, I was mentioning at the beginning. Pollution uh, is a huge issue around islands and, and they are um, magnets for the world's garbage. Um, we also see in places like uh, French Polynesia, uh, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, like uh, Bikini and Inuitak, um, the use uh, of atomic weapons testing uh, and also um, storage of radioactive material, which has also caused um, huge problems in terms of uh, pollution and, and health. So in terms of long-term trends, um, what we see here is islands have succumbed and continue to be impacted by a variety of different natural and anthropogenic impacts. Um, archaeological evidence for natural processes that influence cultural behaviors are also evident, like uh, El Nino. And we see these transported landscapes being a really pivotal part of um, humans moving to, to islands and leaving their mark in some ways, you know, very detrimentally. Uh, and some sustainable practices are evident pre-contact. And we see that in the Caribbean and we see it in the Pacific in places where I've worked. So when we look at islands as model systems, um, are these you know, analogs for the future? How can we look at islands as being somewhat different than other places because they're bounded by this very different environment, in other words, ocean, uh, and use what we see archeologically to predict and, and sort of philosophize um, about what, um, what our humanity um, has in store for the future. Um, ben Finney, who is a very well-known Polynesian um, anthropologist and was um, one of the founding members of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and maybe you've heard of the famous Hokulea, the reconstruction of a Polynesian double hull canoe that's gone around the world to show just how proficient uh, Pacific Islanders were at, um, at wayfinding and navigating long distances across these oceans. Um, he said, the global consequences of seafaring led directly to the bringing together of the many scattered branches of humanity into one global economic system. In effect, completing the first terrestrial phase of human expansion and setting the stage for the second phase of expansion into space. And so Ben Finney early on was making this connection, like, you know, we see this, this movement of humans leaving their, um, their homes and venturing out into places they know very little about. Um, and, you know, what happens when they get there? Uh, you know, how, what, are the, what are the struggles and the psychological issues that people face when being on open ocean for months and months on end? Uh, not not one, you know, wondering whether they'll be able to ever set foot on land again. Michio Kaku, um, who's a famous scientist, um, said either we must leave the earth or we will perish. And he says, we've had three waves of scientific innovation. The first one was the industrial revolution that gave us the steam engine and the locomotive and factories. And the second wave was electricity and magnetism in which we have now TV, internal combustion cars, uh, the beginning of the space program. And the third revolution is high tech computers and lasers and the internet. And now we're approaching the fourth wave, artificial intelligence, biotech, and nanotech. And where will that lead humanity? You are probably familiar with Carl Sagan. And um, in 1994, he wrote, since in the long run, every planetary civilization will be endangered by impacts from space, every, every surviving civilization is obliged to become spacefaring, not because of exploratory or romantic zeal, but for the most practical reason imaginable staying alive. If our long-term survival is at stake, we have a basic responsibility to our species to venture to other worlds. And then Stephen Hawking said, if we can avoid disaster for the next two centuries, our species should be safe as we spread into space. 
If we are the only intelligent beings in the galaxy, we should make sure we survive and continue. Our only chance of long-term survival is not to remain inward looking on planet Earth, but to spread out into space. We have made remarkable progress in the last hundred years, but if we want to continue beyond the next hundred years, our future is in space. And so what Stephen Hawking was referring to was we have gotten to a tipping point and um, he wasn't very optimistic that um, humans on earth will be able to fix all of the issues that we now have. That's a train that's kind of left the station and we, not, we don't necessarily have the means to stop it. Uh, and I think that's you know, shown up pretty clearly in the priorities of different governments around the world, including our own. Our own. And um, he, again, wasn't very optimistic about this. He, he, you know, he, he's anticipating um, in the next 200 years, we're going to see some massive technological revolutions and um, we, not, we might not be able to um, live on earth as we once did and we need to seek out other, uh, other places to live. So the sea level rise, which is kind of the, you know, a, a major part of climate change is essentially a slow moving tsunami. We have global um, ocean temperatures that have been changing since, uh, you know, over the last century. And we are now having climate induced migration where people in the Maldives and the Marshall Islands and these other low lying island nations are now forced and now having to reckon with leaving their homes. Um, we are starting to see this even today in cases uh, of our own uh, own uh, nation, uh, Florida in particular, a very low lying state. And uh, people are predicting, scientists are predicting that uh, by the end of the century, Miami will essentially be unlivable as it is today. Um, just today, uh, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency released a major report uh, and listed the website up here. Um, and they suggested that um, the destruction of year-round permafrost in Alaska, the loss of winter ice on the Great Lakes, and spike in summer heat waves in U.S. cities leading to forest fires, as those of you who live in Oregon and uh, California are well aware, um, all signal that climate change is intensifying. This assessment marks the first time Interestingly, that the agency has said such changes are being driven at least in part by human caused global warming. Michael Regan, the EPA administrator said, we really want to reach people in every corner of this country because there's no small town, big city or rural community that's unaffected by the climate crisis. Um, Americans are seeing and feeling the impacts up close with increasing regularity. So in conclusion, um, islands, as I would argue, are useful model systems for examining human arrival and impact. The archaeological evidence shows both impacts, but also cases of resilience that we can look at as sustainable models for what we can do today. And the historical period institutes a real impactful realm of anthropogenic um, effects. Uh, we see um, commercialization of resources, things like whaling, uh, over-harvesting of um, fish and turtles, uh, other marine organisms, um, which has really caused a cascading effect of problems. Um, Archaeology provides insight into the Anthropocene. And I think what we see, even just using islands over the last few thousand years, that the Anthropocene really doesn't begin during the Industrial Revolution. We are seeing human arrival and impact to these bounded island systems. And we can use these as analogs for trying to understand what we are in for uh, in the near future. So islands are useful corollaries for examining human movement beyond Earth. And so this is something that uh, my colleagues and I are, are starting to write more about. Um, we're starting to put together um, workshops with teams from NASA because NASA is really interested in these questions too. Um, how can we use what we have on Earth to try and best model what humans will deal with in the future? And how can we approach space travel in essentially a, a more sustainable way um, trying to take into account uh, that we might in some ways in the you know, near future over the next um, couple thousand years um, actually um, uh, reach places that have extraterrestrial life and how will we, um, uh, how will we deal with that uh, as humans and humanity. So will humans repeat their mistakes? That's the big question, isn't it always? So uh, I wanna thank you again. Um, if you're ever in Eugene, uh, the museum is now open. Uh, we'd love to see you there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fitzpatrick. That was wonderful. I did not expect us to go into space for some reason during that program. <laughs>
So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, the first one we have here is the gastropods and Palau that got bigger over time because of the, the tarot, I believe. Um, is there any evidence that they were being farmed intentionally? Um, that's a really good question. Um, we don't really have any actually good evidence, interestingly, of people farming uh, marine organisms. Although there are some really good examples that have been identified over recent years. Um, one in particular is um, in Alaska, where people seem to have been growing clams. They're, they basically have clam gardens. So they're taking um, uh, ones that they, um, you know, smaller juveniles, uh, they're um, basically uh, uh, planting isn't the right word, but uh, putting them in a, in a, a segregated area and then um, making sure that they have the proper nutrients and things that they need uh, to grow to maturity. And so those clam gardens are a pretty novel approach on something that has only been recently identified. Um, there's also um, some cases of aquaculture and um, there's a good example in Florida and South Florida where um, uh, Native Americans were essentially um, building islands of shell uh, and also landscapes of a discarded shell and creating these big pools, um, like, you know, equivalent to the size of like seven basketball courts, like these channels and things for, for putting fish and other marine organisms and then harvesting those when they, when they want them. Um, we don't really see that in the Pacific, um, in, uh, otherwise, you know, apart from what we see on the West Coast. Um, not in the islands, but um, but it is a good question. And I think as we look more to the possibility of that, we'll probably find some other cases. What is one thing that has surprised you the most in your research? I think that the thing that's most um, surprised me is the um, the level of cultural continuity that we get in, in some of these islands. Um, especially those that uh, didn't uh, weren't affected so quickly by by uh, Euro European um, colonizers. So, for example, um, Palau, where I work, was colonized maybe around three thousand years ago, and we see some artifacts in archaeological sites, specific kinds of artifacts that are thousands of years old that at European contact were um, still used in very much the same way. And so, so for example, I work at a, a ancient human burial site and we find, um, if you know what pearl shell is, they, um, Palauans made pearl shell tools and they kind of serrated the edge like a saw and they would use these for scraping taro and coconut and things. And um, at historic contact, uh, the only people that had these tools were women, and, and Palau is a very uh, matriarchal, mat matrilineal society. Uh, women hold a lot of power, and um, they were, you know, there's a form of money, essentially, these pearl shell artifacts. And we find these in burials um, only associated with women that are thousands of years old. And so um, for a society that was, you know, pretty um, remote, uh, that was fairly isolated until relatively recently from Europeans, um, we see a lot, lot of co cultural continuity of people persisting uh, and, and finding things that they want to do and continuing on with those and, and what are some pretty sustainable ways, which is pretty interesting. And we just have a thank you um, from someone for the excellent presentation. And I will echo that. Thank you very much. Uh, for sharing your knowledge with us and uh, for having this opportunity to go to the museum. That sounds really fun. Yeah, if and, you haven't been there before, we've got lots of new exhibits and it's a really great place for kids too. Oh, cool. Well, good. I'm glad it's open now. Um, and for those of you in the audience, thank you for joining us on this warm evening. I hope you have a great rest of your night. And please know that we have a lot of recordings like this program on our YouTube channel. This program is recorded and we'll send a link out if you want to send it to someone who may be interested. Um, have a great rest of your evening and enjoy. You too. Thanks for having me.